Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, CNN National Security Analyst Peter Bergen talks about a new project examining the future of war. Find out how European online privacy rules could impact you, and careers in math are adding up to impressive salary figures. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. ASU is teaming up with a Washington-based think tank to focus on the changing nature of war and conflict and how those changes will impact future cultures and societies. Peter Bergen is co-director of the Future of War Project. Bergen is CNN's national security analyst. He's an author and film producer. His new documentary, American War Generals, is being screened tomorrow night here at ASU. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for joining. Very familiar face. You've been everywhere, haven't you? Well, some places. Yes, <laughs> and where, where lots of shots are being fired and where war is being conducted. Before we get started on the conversation, what is war? Well, I mean, war is a, a, a feature of the human condition that is not going to disappear because uh, it's a competition about, often about fear or interests or, um, and sometimes it's just necessary, you know, no one wants war, of course, uh, but the famous line from, uh, from Lenin, which is, uh, you know, you may not be interested in war, but war may be interested in you. Yes. Uh, so, so, you know, we, the point of this project is to kind of consider how war is changing because as we were discussing, it, war is, the clean line between war and peace doesn't really exist anymore in the sense, you know, we don't, Al-Qaeda isn't going to have some kind of armistice agreement with the United States. Our conflict with them will be a lengthy. Uh, the drone campaign we have in Pakistan, we're, you know, it's a warlike activity, but we're not at war with Pakistan. It's a kind of, or, or, or the cyber attacks that the Chinese are launching against us <clears throat> are they acts of war? Are they merely cyber espionage? Are they cyber, you know, what, what is it? What, when a cyber attack gets big enough, at what point would we say, hey, that actually merits some warlike response from us? And these are some of the questions we're trying to answer. Indeed, and that, that's why I kind of asked a question for yeah. a definition because it's, it's really hard to figure out. I've used the comparison of it being kind of a low-grade fever all around mm -hmm. the world. You just can't seem to knock it out. The conflict, in, instead of beginning and ending, it just seems to go on. Yeah, well, and obviously the war in Iraq is now in its 11th year with its, could go on for another decade. I mean, these, and so many of the wars that we, 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 that we see around the world are insurgencies or civil wars, and they tend to go on for a long time. In fact, the academic literature suggests that they take at least a decade, and sometimes, as we've seen in Colombia, there's been an insurgency going on in Colombia now for four decades from the FARC. So, you know, war is kind of changing. Uh, uh, certainly the kinds of wars that we, the United States has been engaged in, or we think of war, we think of World War II, and there's a beginning, a middle, or an end. And, uh, I'm, you know, it's much more likely that the United States is going to be engaged in what we're seeing in Iraq, which is we're going back in small numbers of special operations. I mean, the president said no, no American boots on the ground. Well, that's perhaps euphemistic because there are, after all, American advisors in Iraq already, mm -hmm. and there may, be, you know, the president is considering whether to send advisors to Syria uh, or, you know, some kind of military response in Syria. And, and you, you mentioned military advisors. People of a certain age will go, I remember that back in the 60s with sure. Vietnam. Yeah, 1962, President Kennedy, Vietnam, it started small. The, uh, the impact, and you mentioned uh, technology, the impact of drones, special ops, civilian targets, civilian uh, areas being used as bases, that's all very new. Yeah, in some ways it's back to the future. I mean, we we tend to, war is changing, and we used to tend to think of its combatants and civilians, and but now of course Al-Qaeda is, you know, a place, is a group without uniforms, it doesn't have headquarters, it doesn't have a conventional chain of command. And when I say Al-Qaeda, I mean groups like I ISIS in, in Iraq is a sort of uh, splinter group from Al-Qaeda. Uh, so the kinds of enemies the United States are facing are, pl are playing by different rules. Um, and trying to understand that. Uh, but, you know, we're seeing it with, with, you know, we haven't seen cyber terrorism yet, but we've seen uh, non-state actors using cyber attacks. There was a Sy Syrian free ele electronic army launched a, a cyber attack on the Associated Press in which they basically were able to manipulate the information the AP was putting out saying there'd be an attack on the White House and that ca caused the Dow to drop by 150 points. So the point is, is that this group, which is probably affiliated with the Syrian government in some way, 
that shows that these you know shadowy groups with no return addresses can you know perhaps play in the cyberspace in a bigger way and actually have effects on the American society. So the Future of War project, what, looks at what's happening out there right now, compares to the past, looks at what possibly could be in the future. What's going to happen here? Yeah, we're going to, I mean, we're a group of people with a lot of different backgrounds. ASU brings, you know, it's one of the, the largest public research university in the country. We're a Washington-based think tank. We have technologists, we have lawyers, we have experts on national security, the military, um, and we're all trying to think together about a, well, let's try and describe what the state of play is, and B, when we, once we've described the state of play, say, well, you know, what, if anything, should we be thinking about in terms of maybe new international laws or norms around the use of cyber warfare drones? Because, you know, the United States has a monopoly, had a monopoly on armed drones and had a monopoly on effective armed, uh, you know, cyber attacks. Uh, that isn't going to last forever, and it's sort of analogous to we used to have a monopoly on nuclear weapons, and at a certain point we didn't, and then it becomes, well, we need to have rules of the road, so, because the rules, the rules of the road benefit everybody, including the United States. Uh, so the, you know, the longer term is to say what kind of legal frameworks should we be thinking about in terms of when states use armed drones across borders, or you know, how should we think about uh, a cyber attack that it, it, it reaches an act of war? Is there some sort of threshold that we would consider is or should there be international norms about that threshold. And, and, and when you discuss these things, when you research these things, I, I, I go back to Abu Sayyaf and Boko Haram and, and mm. ISIS and Aya, whatever they're calling yeah. themselves these days, and Al-Qaeda, and you mentioned the rules of the road from a distance. You, you covered these people, you talked yeah. to them, you yeah. interviewed Osama bin Laden for goodness sakes. Right. Um, it doesn't seem like there are any rules or any roads. It just seems right. chaos. <laughs> But you know, the United States is the guarantor of international order, and we've benefited tremendously from that. And so we have a, uh, we the United States have a strong interest in creating rules of the road because, sure, Al Qaeda may not observe them, but other states, the Chinese, the Russians, the Iranians, you know, these countries now have armed drones, and they can say, hey, you know, the the way you've been using them, we think they're a group of people we consider terrorists just outside our borders. Uh, you've kind of created the precedent. So we need to be thinking about a regime that you know, everybody can agree to. Uh, you know, 1925, every country around the world said, we are not going to use chemical weapons. Um, and so, and that has been pretty effective. For uh, the most part, yeah. Yeah, so and obviously in World War One they were used routinely. So, you know, it's not pie in the sky to sort of say, well, you know, war, throughout history or throughout recent history, luckily, we war is being constrained by law and that's, part of our interest is to try and think about what are the international legal frameworks to think about how of changing nature of war, what, how should the international community think about it? And, and in your dealings, again, in the Middle East, especially uh, from Afghanistan to uh, even Africa and all, all points in between, and what we see is Islamic extremism, groups that seem to be taking a religion and using it for entirely political purposes, mm -hmm. be that as it may. When you see this, does it feel like it's a major bump in history, or is history making a turn and going in that direction as far as the future of conflict? Well, I think these Al-Qaeda-like groups, I mean, they got unfortunately lucky on 9-11. They're not going to get lucky again in that way at all. I mean, they, they're, look, Al-Qaeda and the, the groups that are uh, subscribed to its ideology, they're a huge problem in the Middle East right now. But, I mean, as, a, as an American national security problem, you know, we, our defensive measures have changed dramatically. I mean, just a, there was no TSA on 9-11, there was no DHS, there was no National Counterterrorism Center, the FBI and the CIA didn't talk to each other. You know, public, the public wasn't aware this is a problem. We're a very hard target now. So even if one of these groups tries to get together and attack, it's not likely to succeed, except in the case of homegrown extremists mm -hmm. influenced by the ideology, which we saw in Boston and we saw at Fort Hood. And, you know, it's hard to prevent that, basically. And yet in Europe, very different scenario and other areas around the world. I mean, we're separated by a couple of oceans here. We're, we're yeah. very secure in that way. Can't say that over in parts of Europe. Well, you can drive from Paris to Damascus, right? I mean, yes. so it's, you know, it's a whole different deal. And we've already seen people coming from the Syrian conflict. On May 24th, a Frenchman uh, allegedly killed four people at a Jewish museum in Brussels, and he'd basically been trained in Syria. So, you know, for the Europeans, it's a much bigger problem because it's much more proximate and many more of their citizens have gone. I mean. 700 Germans, 300 plus French, you know, 500 plus Brits. We've had 100 Americans who've either gone or attempted to go, um, and that's not great. 
but it's a much smaller number, particularly since we're a much larger population. As far as your film, real quickly before you go now, yeah. you're screening a film tomorrow night. Talk to us about this and uh, what exactly you were trying to get across. Well, we basically, it goes to some of the things we, we've just been discussing, which is it's, it's about the army and it's told through the, the stories and, and careers of the leading combat generals, General Powell, General Petraeus, General McChrystal and others. Um, and you know, the army is always preparing for the, for the fight they can win. The, the fight they want to fight. They want to fight, you know, the yeah. Germans or the, or they want to fight, you know, Saddam Hussein's tank army. Because and they, but what happens whether it's in Vietnam or Iraq or Afghanistan, something comes up which is a very different form of fight, and uh, it's really about that kind of tension and and how the army sort of both learns and then forgets and comes back and re relearns the lessons of previous conflicts, uh, which is basically a lot of these conflicts are going to be guerrilla wars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. which are messy and lengthy and complicated. Well, with that in mind, before we let you go, I have to ask you one question. Are you optimistic in general over things? Yeah, I'm a huge optimist. I mean, I, you know, I think when history, if you consider the things that have happened in the last century, the Holocaust, World War I and World War II, what we're going through now is just a minor blip. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank, Thank you for joining us. We Thank appreciate you. it. A recent court case in Europe strengthened the right to online privacy, a move that puts freedom of speech concerns in the U.S. against what Europe sees as the right to be forgotten. Adriana Sanford is with ASU's W.P. Carey School of Business, and he joins us now. She joins us now, I should say, to talk about. First of all, thank you for joining us. Um, what exactly did the EU rule on regarding the right to privacy? Well, first of all, in the EU, we have, they believe in the basic human right to privacy. We don't have that here in this country. And as a result of that, and as a result of the Snowden revelations, they are now coming up with an EU regulation. And within that regulation, it's going to be very different. It's going to be binding, and it's going to have an extraterritorial effect. The part of it is the right to be forgotten, which basically says if you are an individual, and there's no necessity, no reason behind it, after a certain amount of time, your data, your information that's on the internet can be taken away and it can be erased. The question is, can it be erased? And if it can't be erased, they have to find a way of blocking it or not having it so that it doesn't continue to affect you. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds almost impossible to achieve. I mean, once it's on the internet, it seems like it never dies. That's a concern that some of the companies have and there are many others with this new regulation that's coming out. Another, another concern is this new 24-hour notice for our hack attacks, for mm -hmm. these breaches. And these are concerns that the companies have and we think within the next few months they're going to iron them out. Uh, the regulation has gone through the EU Commission, it's gone through the Parliament, it's now at the stage with the Council with the European Council and we have the companies that are lobbying and we have the different you know, governments of the different countries that are lobbying and, and, and basically tweaking. I was going to say Microsoft and Google and Yahoo, uh, it, it seems to me though it, they got to be on board or there's nothing to get on board, is there? Well right now one of the hot issues is what's going on with Microsoft because the U.S. government gave a search warrant for certain information in, in the cloud and that those emails were actually in Dublin, in Ireland, and this is one of the hot topics right now is whether or not Microsoft has to actually turn that over, and uh, the U.S. government has said yes, and Microsoft is concerned because this, here we have a conflict of laws because under EU directive, right now 
they would have to first go to the EU and let them know. And you know, this is a this is a problem of conflict of laws. It, it, and it really, it's it sounds like th like Google again. From what I read, they're basically saying, okay, we'll change our euro version or we'll change that. But the mothership back here, we're not going to change any of that. It, they have to change the mothership, or else it's again, it doesn't go away. This this all this stuff that you want removed, it may be removed in Europe, but in Peoria, there it is. Well, and, and, and let's back up for a minute. If we take a look at what this new EU regulation is doing, it's going to be very different from the directive that's in place right now. The directive that's in place is non-binding, so it's a patchwork over there. And depending on which countries you're working with, they have adopted different variations of the EU data protection directive. And what's going to happen now is it will reach U.S. businesses even if you don't have operations over there. If you, for any reason, are working, either monitoring the EU citizens or you are on the internet and you're selling your goods or services, or maybe you have an employee, you have employees from the EU, right. it will touch you. So it, its effect, its extraterritorial reach is a lot larger. And any U.S. business that's dealing with the EU in any one of these areas is going to have to comply. For example, with the notification, the 24-hour notification for breaches, mm -hmm. the second an EU citizen is notified, well, we know through the grounds well, through social media, through, you know, through the news, we're going to find out about it over here. So it's going to help our citizens here, our consumers, are going to know about these hacks much uh, more, you know, much sooner than it is happening right now. So realistically, in, in the real world, the real online cyber world here, can you have a region, a Europe, a China perhaps in the future, whatever, uh, say, I do not want my personal opinion out there. The, the government says we are going to block that. Per can that realistically happen when other parts of the world, say the U.S., aren't participating? It is, it's a hot topic. We don't know what's going to happen. But what I can tell you is once that EU regulation comes out, it is going to be adopted by other regions, by other countries as well. There are so many people right now, so many governments that are waiting for this to come out because the EU has been on the forefront of a lot of this. In 1995, the EU Data Protection Directive is when the Internet came out. That was the first one out there. Uh, with regards to gatekeepers, the gatekeepers initiative came from there. The Know Your Customer came from the EU. So everybody is waiting. Everybody is very concerned about what's going on right now mm -hmm. with these hacks, with privacy. Privacy is huge. So these other countries and these other regions of the world, some in Latin America, some in Africa, are waiting for this. So we are going to see a huge change. And maybe that will affect our government here. And we'll start to see changes, maybe a reform here as well. So that, that, that seems to be what's next in all this. When are we going to see what's next in all this? Well, in 2013, we noticed that a lot of our states started passing their own laws to try to help consumers with regards to the breaches, with regards to privacy. So in the United States, we have a patchwork right now, which makes it hard. And it actually is not cost effective. It's, it's a burden, bureaucrat, uh, bureaucratic burden mm -hmm. for these companies. So maybe we'll see a change there. Maybe we'll see national legislation. It would be nice to have comprehensive legislation in this area. Yeah, well, it's very fascinating, complex, but it is uh, the brave new world out there. Thank you so yes. much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. 
Get the 8 Insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. A new report ranking the best jobs of 2014 shows the top four spots taken by math-related positions. Here to talk more about mathematics as a career choice is Al Bogus, director of ASU's School of Mathematical and Statistical Sciences, and Yelena Milovanovic, a senior lecturer at the school. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining Thank us. You. Um, this is at careercast.com. Matt, number one for best jobs in 24. What's going on out there? Well, I think it's a reflection that math is everywhere. It underlies all the technology that we use today, from telecommunications to medical imaging to statistics used in data analysis. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, everybody's running around with these smartphones. Right. And smartphones, you pull up YouTube videos, you surf the internet. That's a lot of information that has to get transmitted all over the universe and there are millions of people trying to download it. Well, how does that happen? There's a lot of sophisticated electronics here, but there's mathematical algorithms that compress the data to make it possible for you to get all that data out there. And, and the versatility of mathematics, I think, plays a part in here, doesn't it? I mean, it's not just this. I mean, you're talking an entire world out there. Of course we are, and we're giving the students the ability and the knowledge to change the world. I mean, especially, especially in particular with actuarial science. Talk to us more about that. Uh, people ask me all the time what actuarial science is all about. And um, I say that these are the financial surgeons of the risk world. They put a financial value um, on risk. And predominantly, actuaries are known to work in insurance. But these days, they're in all kinds of industries. One example would be infrastructure, where they're talking about, you know, should that bridge be replaced? Is it time to, you know, service a rail line, for example? Yes. So we are expanding in different, um, in different sectors other than the financial one. And, and, and again, when, when kids come to, to ASU or come to your classes, do they think analytics or they just want, they happen to be good in high school and this is something that they want to pursue? How does that work? Well, we're trying to expand the market to attract more students into the mathematical sciences. A lot of people come, they think, well, all I can do with math is teach when they're mm -hmm. a freshman. Uh, and of course, teaching is a wonderful occupation. I've been a teacher for 35 years. But there's so much you can do with mathematics, especially with combined with other areas, like a minor in computer science or a minor in uh, finance, a minor in physics or biology. So math can get used in all sorts of ways. And in the past, there, there was an actual effort to get more women involved in math and mathematical areas. Um, are you seeing more women students? Yes, we are actually. Um, we just started a program to meet this high demand in actuarial science at ASU. And I can say without a doubt that the population of males versus females is about equal, 50-50%, which is quite encouraging. Um, only 15 years ago when I was um, in college, that was not the case. I was maybe one, one in four in yeah. terms of the gender ratio. So what got you interested in this? I was always good at math, I just didn't know what to do with that, other than teach. And of course, as, as Al has said, this is a noble profession, but I wanted something more, I wanted a challenge. And I went to a career fair, and I heard actuarial science, and I said, what is that? And they said, if you excel in math, and you want a challenge, this is a career for you. And it, it, that's exactly what it was. And, and again, in society, it seems like it's a numbers-based society all over the place. Uh, it, it seems as though we're heading in that direction. Yes, I mean, there, there's data everywhere. They, businesses use data, we have to analyze data in, in like pharmaceutical companies have to analyze data to see which drugs are, are best. So data is everywhere. With that, with that in mind, is there a renaissance now in math? I think so. I think uh, people are becoming more aware that mathematics offers potential. The, the, the data on these jobs, the four best jobs and the salaries that, uh, that mathematicians are getting upon graduation and the, uh, the growth in careers, 23% uh, career growth yeah. projected in the next six to eight years. My goodness, there they are, mathematician, professor, statistician, and actuary. Um, advice for a young person right now who's saying, well, geez, I, I'm actually pretty good at math. I never thought about going in that direction. What advice for someone curious in a math career? Come and talk to us. Come and visit us on campus. We have an amazing program that is attracting you know, a, lot of, a lot of interest. Um, I, th I think that if you like math and you excel and you're a good communicator and you want a challenge, then this is a career for you. Not only because of that, but because you want something that is changing every day. So a career that you know, ranks number top four in the last six years, for example, 
has to do with jo overall job, uh, job satisfaction in terms of pay, working condition and security. Mm -hmm. So this is something not to pass on lightly. And, and when you're dealing with employers, what advice to give to them when they're saying this person's a math major? Hmm. Math majors are very popular with uh, recruiters in all sorts of businesses. They like the logical problem solving skills that mathematicians have. They like the patience that mathematicians have to actually keep at a problem until it's solved. All right. Well, it's good to have you both here. Great information and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.